Hello and welcome. In January, I was in Davos to attend discussions on nature and biodiversity and had the chance to sit down with Florian Weber, head of partnerships for Chloris Geospatial. Chloris technology assesses carbon being drawn down by the atmosphere through above ground biomass, effectively weighing trees from space. So I hope you'll enjoy the conversation in the next episode. Please feel free to like, comment, or subscribe below. The audio version of the podcast is available on most platforms or can be found on betterworlds.com. Thank you. I mean, biodiversity, essentially, you know, it's a concept. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas carbon is a physical unit, you can measure it. Um, and that's really like where the debate is at. How do you measure biodiversity? Mm -hmm. um, it's not yet clear, right? Nature inspires human solutions. She gives us the blueprints, designing harmonious systems where all of the parts support each other. How do we use nature as our guide and our teacher to help our planet thrive and improve our future? Welcome to Nature Is, where we brainstorm, share innovative ideas, and have conversations to stir our spirits and elevate our actions for a better world. Great to be with you, Florian. Here we are in Davos. <laughs> Here we are again. Mm -hmm. Florian Rever, uh, head of partnerships with Chloris Geospatial. Um, most importantly, tell us about your ski tour this morning. Uh, importantly, we ground ourselves in nature before we get into a conversation on nature preservation. Yes, yeah, thanks, Laura. It, yeah, it was an adventurous day. <laughs> we thought we'd be out for maybe five hours ended up being eight okay uh, so yeah for once the way down took longer than usual <laughs> uh, also uh, normally you want to have the good snow on the way down we had it on the way up okay uh, so not everything <laughs> went as planned but it was definitely a good day you know it's always good to be outside and enjoy the mountains yes any day in the mountains is a good one any day in the mountains is a good day yes Excellent. Well, tell us about geospatial technology and Chloris's role and, um, and what you do. It's a fascinating company, but at a high level, I think it would be really helpful for people to understand the mission of the business. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Lara. So Chloris Geospatial, um, it's a space tech company um, really focused on nature tech. So you could say we're at the intersection of space tech and nature tech. Um, and uh, we are like, you know, a new kind of natural capital data company. It's really like what we do is generating um, high quality natural capital data. Our mission as a company is to s support and accelerate the transition to a net zero nature positive economy with the most reliable, trustworthy and cost effective natural capital data. Um, our core expertise really is in above ground biomass, which essentially is the, the carbon stored in woody vegetation, mm -hmm. trees, forests, shrubs, mangroves, um, which is a, a, a key part of um, the challenge to realizing credible nature-based solutions. That's great. I mean, it's such a impactful model. And as you think about the technology how can how would you explain the technology and is there a role here that AI is also playing um, as you as you capture these images I remember one of the analogies was weighing trees from space which I thought was such a uh, vivid explanation of what you do but perhaps you can give a little bit more flavor to the technology piece yes uh, I'd love to thanks Laura for the question and AI absolutely is a central part of it and uh, you you're right and uh, we like to say that um, we weigh trees from space and that it's the best alternative to you know, weighing them uh, by like cutting them down, oven drying them and weighing them. Obviously that is not an option um, if it's about conservation and restoration practices. Um, but like really, if you want to know the carbon stored in trees, you have to weigh the trees. The mm -hmm. biomass is like the essential part of it. Now the way we do this is, um, you know, it's a machine learning 
um, AI model train with high quality LIDAR data mm -hmm. from airborne and spaceborne sensors. Mm -hmm. So at various altitudes. That really gives you like global coverage training data. Now, it's not only important that you get the global coverage, but it's of course important that the training data is high quality. So we invest a lot into that. Um, some of the sensors we use were also like trained, uh, were calibrated uh, by our own chief scientist, but then also like um, you know, pre-filtering that training data so that you only retrain, uh, retain the, the highest quality training data. Um, so that gives you like a LIDAR based forest, glo a global forest inventory, point based. Um, what you really want to know though is like, or really want to have is like wall to wall maps of the both So mm -hmm. the AI and machine learning algorithm um, takes that training data and fuses it with other Earth observation information. Uh, images, for example, right? Um, here, images of the Earth. And then we look at how the reflectance data in these pixels is changing over time. And that allows us then to create wall-to-wall -wall maps of above ground biomass with values for every pixel and showing you how this is changing over time. And because it's like um, you know, a, a model trained at that large scale or models trained at the large scale, it allows us to do that with um, consistency and like full scalability in, in space and time, which is really important also to compare the impact mm -hmm. of those various nature-based solutions, those projects around geography. So it gives you a, a consistent data source on the impact of those projects. Amazing. I mean, this must be an increasingly important tool now as we see what's happened with the carbon markets, voluntary carbon markets in the last year and some of the scrutiny that those have come under. Um, and so the technology you're describing from a monitoring, reporting, and valuation perspective must be really um, increasingly important. Are you are you seeing that in some of the clients that are interested in using the technology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is really like not at the cutting edge of innovation. And um, for the, for many years there has been, let's say the innovation has happened in the academic world. Mm -hmm. The market and the methodologies and the standards, they stuck a little bit like um, no, conventional approaches, um, which uh, you know have been around for a long time, um, uh, but technology moved on. And now we really see like the leaders in the market embracing that technology because you know, it gives you um, better transparency, mm -hmm. gives you better scalability. It also like you know, allows you to get that quality at you know, a fraction of the cost of how you could have maybe gotten some of that data in a you know, field work based approach, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's not only about the quality, but it's also about the scalability and the speed at which you can get um, that data. Um, because also you know, this is like generated with a, a software, a mm -hmm. cloud based software. So it's not only, um, again, it's not only the data, but it's also like how you access it essentially at the speed of business we generate data very, very fast. So what we see is a um, strong interest um, by companies in the voluntary carbon market, mm -hmm. um, developers, funds, also standards, um, and then entire jurisdictions who use the data um, to look like at huge areas uh, to generate um, carbon credits at the jurisdiction scale. But then also some of the supply chain companies who use this to sort of monitor their um, <coughs> their footprint throughout like commodity supply chains such as palm oil and cocoa um, and also um, uh, better understand the impact of insetting projects, so the, the removal speeds of it. Mm. And um, just to drill a little bit deeper on that, how our customers are using the data, you know, and baselines is an important topic, um, particularly in the carbon markets, establishing more robust baselines, um, that's something, that's the clear use case of our data. Originating credits, because we deliver maps with quantified uncertainty, higher quality credits, and more higher quality credits. So it's not mm -hmm. only the quality, but also you get more of it, right? Because you have that better data source that you use um, to design those projects. Um, and then also standards um, are using it now to certify 
projects on their registries. So there are these kind of examples um, of how companies are using our data. That's great. And it, would it be fair to say that that's also one of the ways that businesses are leveraging your technology um, as they begin to look at uh, nature positive initiatives within the company. I think that maybe not everyone understands what that is, but it, it sounds like in some of the latter descriptions you were just conveying that, that that may be one of the ways that they're utilizing the technology to really help to bring those initiatives to the fore incredibly so. I think so. I mean, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, right, this is all, of course, carbon focused. Mm -hmm. um, and you no know, nature positive is about more than carbon. Yeah. It's also about biodiversity, for example. Um, now, um, with the data that we have, um, you get important um, information also, like the, the structure of the vegetation um, on the connectivity um, of, of the habitats, for example. So we see the both the horizontal and the vertical complexity mm -hmm. um, of vegetation. Mm -hmm. um, which is a uh, which correlates very strongly with you no know, biodiversity and intactness of ecosystems. So that data um, indeed also has a very important role to play when it comes to you know, understanding whether um, the impact of certain business practices is you know, going in favor of nature positive nature positivity or not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an, an important piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. and um, and I think there is a, a part of like. No, net zero, nature positive, um, which is you know, clearly it's two sides of the same coin to some extent as well. Right? Yeah, no, that's an important distinction because, um, yeah, we know that biodiversity is, is even more difficult to, um, yeah. to assess. Exactly. I mean, biodiversity essentially, you know, it's a concept. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas carbon is a physical unit, you can measure it. Um, and that's really like where the debate is at. How do you measure biodiversity? Mm -hmm. um, it's not yet clear, right? Yeah. And uh, it's very complex. Uh, it's obviously very important that we find um, the right metrics also um, for, for, for biodiversity. And um, this is really, I think, some uh, an element where uh, we can hopefully also learn a lot from, mm -hmm. from carbon markets. Um, we also have to understand yeah, that it, I think it is different. Now, I'm not the expert on biodiversity, <laughs> but I think something I understand is that it's, dif it's different to try to find a metric to quantify a concept, a human-made concept, versus like a physical quantity such as carbon. Absolutely, and the technology that you're deploying is, is instrumental in all of these things. Um, so as we sit here in Davos, what do you think a good outcome for nature is, either in the Congress Center or on the periphery as a whole? What what would be a good outcome, do you think? Yes. Uh, um, so what would be a good outcome for this week? I think it's also in the context of what has happened last year. No, um, it was definitely a difficult year for carbon markets. It was a good year for carbon markets as well, because a lot of the fundamental issues came to the surface, mm -hmm. were discussed, um, and I think that unlocked a, a, a race to its integrity. Mm -hmm. um, so if Davos can continue that and also, you know, really like hold, share messages and raise awareness of like holding people accountable, doing the right thing in the right way, I think that um, is important messaging that can come out of Davos. I also think that um, uh, there is continued need to um, uh, showing that we have a lot of both ands that we have to harness and avoid falling into the trap of looking at things in, in terms of either or, like mm -hmm. either technology or nature solutions. We need both, both and <laughs> both and and within the nature agenda, um, it's a false dichotomy to look at removals versus avoidance. Mm -hmm. We need both. And as a matter of fact, you know, forest conservation projects called avoidance projects because they're designed to avoid deforestation from happening. These projects can be large um, uh, sources of removals. Mm -hmm. Arguably in some cases much more, much 
uh, uh, more, they remove much more carbon than young restoration projects. Um, so, but we need both. Right? Yeah, yeah. We need to restore, and we definitely also uh, need to avoid um, uh, deforestation. And um, I think um, Davos is a place where you know, top-level executives can receive that those messages. And if this sinks in a little bit more mm -hmm. at the end, or has something in a little bit more at the end of this week with a few more people, I think that's a good outcome. That sounds like a great outcome. I agree. So last question, and I think I know the answer to this based on the, the opening bit of our conversation. Where are you most at home in nature? When I can, I like to spend my, my free time out in the mountains. Well, we can see why. and. Um, and that's where we became friends, actually. That's so, right. you yes. know, ma many good things come from time in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Florian, thank you so much for your time and your insights and the amazing work you do in the world. Keep it up and, um, and I look forward to our next ski tour. Likewise, thanks so much, <laughs>